This is an overview of the wireless player turn, turn 4, 5.30 p.m. No visibility checks. We are viewing the battlefield from the right flank of the royalist position. The index card is here to help mitigate the effects of the overhead light on plexiglass, in case you're wondering. Um, this turn's goal for the royalist player is an attempt to um, fix his uh, horse units on his right flank or or at least pull back to where they have a chance to rally because at the moment most of them are adjacent to non disrupted parliamentarian units so the only way they're going to recover is to pull back and hopefully recover uh, at some subsequent phase it seems to me like it's fairly easy once you put a unit out of um, once you disorder it or disrupt it I'll get those terms here one of these days that it's very hard to get them back if you can move non-disrupted units adjacent to them so anyway that's what we're looking at on the royalist right in the Royalist Center, they seem to have straightened out their lines and will probably begin an assault on and across the ditch this turn. They're going to have to be a little bit more aggressive if they're going to make any headway. So far, they're in pretty good shape. Both their leaders. Um, for the um, White Coats, Newcastle's forces. Um, both Newcastle himself and Ethian are positioned to rally on the next turn any units which are eligible. So we'll see what that brings for next uh, for this turn. And on the Royalist left flank, um, Goring's horse is going to have to charge across the ditch and engage Thomas Fairfax's horse as they did historically and force it back um, back to Cromwell's plump where historically they stopped to raid and plunder the uh, baggage train in which many of the units become disrupted um, taking them out of the fight effectively. Historically, the center of the Royalist line pushed the uh, parliamentarians back, but when Cromwell made his um, left flank envelopment of Byron's horse on the right flank of the Royalists, that's when he was able to come around and uh, hit the Royalist center foot and pretty much scatter them except for a few who retreated back to the uh, white site close so I'm gonna go ahead and move and uh, rally artillery move and then we'll see what the position is after that this shows the position of the wireless players units on their right flank after the movement phase or the march phase. They have pulled back in an attempt to form a defensive position to at least slow down Cromwell's horse on their left uh, on their left flank. In the center the Royalists have went ahead pulled back any disorder or disrupted units and went ahead and have moved their infantry across the ditch to engage the allied forces defending there. And then uh, bottom part of the field 
try to block that uh, thing a little bit. We have uh, on the left flank, left wing so to speak, we have uh, Goring and his heavy cavalry are going to go ahead and cross the ditch and engage Thomas Fairfax's horse. And uh, we'll see how they fare during the combat system or during the combat phase. Here we are, Cromwell's victory, Battle of Marston Moor, 2 July 1644. This is an overhead view of the position at turn 5 to 6 o'clock uh, p.m. turn. There are still no visibility checks. And it is the Allied Rally phase. I'm going to go ahead and kind of do a more detailed uh, turn example. Um, this turn, and then I probably will just kind of do a summary after I finish playing the game. We're almost halfway through. I'll probably play out two or three turns, kind of show an overall <clears throat> position on the board talk about anything substantial that happened and then I'll probably uh, wrap it up and uh, kind of talk about the actual battle and the regarding the battle versus the game so anyway I'm gonna go ahead and try to do this turn in detail or at least portions of the game in detail to once again explain the game system and all that so I'll be back. Visibility. At the beginning of each game turn, the Royalist player gets to roll for a visibility check starting with turn 7 and continuing on to turn 12. The first six turns, there is no visibility check. If it is turn 7 or later the royalist player will roll a die and he'll modify the result by adding 2 if it is game turn 8 or game turn 9 he'll modify it by 3 if it is game turn 10 he'll modify it by plus 4 if it is game turn 11 and plus 5 if it is game turn 12 so he'll roll a d6 Let's say this is game turn, let's say it's game turn 8. So, slide over here so you can see the die. So let's say the Royalist player rolled a 2 and it's game turn 8. He has a plus 2 to the die roll, so he rolled actually a 4. Now it says here, <clears throat> These modifications are summarized on the turn track. If the modified die roll result is a 1 through 3, the visibility is clear. But our modified die roll here is a plus 4, or a 4. Uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, obviously. Uh, let's see. If the modified die roll result is a 4 or 5, visibility is obscured. If the modified die roll results in a 6, the visibility is minimal. The effects of the various visibility levels are detailed in the cases below. In our case, we have, what did I say? <laughs> it's obscured. So, obscured visibility will restrict the ability of units to move and rally. So, the movement allowance of all ordered units, but not leaders or disrupted units, is halved whenever visibility is obscured. In addition, one is added to the die roll for each rally check whenever visibility is obscured. So you're not modifying the actual rally number, you are modifying the die roll of the rally check. <clears throat> Whereas leadership bonuses add to the rally number, increasing the chance of a rally. So for example, I guess, I'll just use Moore here, who is in the dead pile. 
His movement rate on the right is a four. Try and zoom in here just a little bit without losing everything. So normally, using the road, he'd go one, two, three, four. But with a obscured um, visibility, he's only gonna have a movement rate of two. So he'll be able to just move one, two. So it basically cuts the movement rate of foot <clears throat> and horse in half. Let's see, I think that is the major effect on, uh, uh, let's see, obscured visibility. Of course, uh, minimal visibility restricts things uh, even more. Restricts the ability of units to move, rally, and charge, and it just severely restricts the ability of artillery pieces to fire. So during minimal visibility game turns, all effects of obscured visibility are in full effect. That's the adding one to the die roll uh, morale check and units moving half. In addition, artillery pieces can't fire more than a two hex uh, distance. So we'll move over here. I'm going to take more off the field since he's a casualty. So we'll move over here to say um, the parliamentarian artillery. I don't know if that's a good example, but um, their visibility then becomes a range, of, or their range becomes a two. So obviously they can only fire out to this uh, hex row if uh, they were permitted to do so, but their line of sight is blocked, of course, by their own units. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and heavy horse units can charge only if they are stacked with or adjacent to a leader of the same force or color at the end of their movement phase. So, we'll take Goring here, I guess. <clears throat> and... If I get Goring in the picture. Goring is here. Okay. We'll take Goring and the unit under him, Langsdale. Uh, both of which, uh, well, Langsdale has only a three because it's also obscured. And let's say he's going to go pick on Lambert. I don't know if that's a good example or not. Lambert uh, with uh, Fairfax's cavalry. So, artillery can fire out to two, and heavy horse can charge only if they are stacked with. Okay, I cannot use Lambert because heavy horse cannot uh, uh, charge um, other horse. I have to use a disordered parliamentarian unit. So normally, Goring would uh, attack with, uh, he could charge a disordered um, enemy unit and double his firepower plus the bonus. So he'd basically be a 20, 22 if stacked with gearing and he could just move up and do a charge at like 20, 22, whatever. However, with minimum visibility, he's only he only has half move, which still doesn't really affect it. That's three hexes. I'll put him over here. Um, he can only charge when he's stacked with or adjacent to a leader and ends that movement face with the leader. So one, two, and then he would go ahead and charge uh, Kupar by, by uh, still doubling, I guess. And all that... Uh, and all that goes with that. <clears throat> so, you know, that's pretty much how visibility would affect uh, most units in the game. Uh, find out where I had all these guys. Looks like Goring was leading the charge. And Kupar was uh, over here on these cannons, disrupting. Okay. So, that's pretty much it for the visibility phase. There's also a special restriction if you roll an unmodified die roll of a six. Uh, 
<clears throat> visibility is considered clear except for the effects listed in this case. No other visibility effects occur during this game turn. If an unmodified six is rolled, both rally phases and both artillery phases are skipped during that game turn. In addition, every die roll on the combat table during the game turn is reduced by two. Uh, okay, and all attacking units that are still ordered after their attack have been resolved or immediately disrupted. Okay, then next will come the uh, rally phase. And uh, you must attempt to rally all units which are eligible. The active player finds a morale rating. The active player modifies the printed morale rating by adding to it the command rating of any one leader of his choice that is of the same force or color as the unit and that is either stacked in the same hex width or adjacent to the unit. The active player will add 2 to the number found in step 2 if the unit for which he is making the rally check is a foot unit in a close hex, or he adds 1 to the number found in step 2 if the unit, regardless of its type, is in its own train hex. Uh, let's see, he subtracts 2 from the number found in step 2 if the unit, regardless of its type, is in the enemy train hex. This, model, uh, this represents the looting of the train hex, and uh, the harder it will be to rally those troops while they're plundering the other side's uh, um, baggage train. Then the active player will roll one die and add one to the result that the visibility is obscured or minimal and compares the result to the modified uh, rating found in step three. And that's where the leader adds to the rating and visibility affects the die roll. If you roll less than or equal to your modified morale rating, the unit will rally, flip it over. If the result is greater than the modified morale rating, the unit remains disrupted and the active player makes a rally check for the next eligible unit. So, we're going to use for example, uh, just a couple other things here I guess. You make the check for all eligible disrupted units. You must make a check for them. Your eligibility for a rally check is affected by the proximity of enemy units and the morale of the army of which it is part. I'll discuss uh, demoralization of an army later. Units are ineligible for a rally check when next to ordered enemy units unless the disrupted unit is a foot unit in a woods, close, or train hex and all the ordered enemy units are horse units. Units that are part of a demoralized army are ineligible for a rally check unless they uh, any of the following statements apply to the unit. The unit is stacked in the same hex with the leader of the same force. The unit is one of the six horses, horse units of, the Man of Manchester's force. The unit is one of the seven foot units of Newcastle's force. Except as noted herein, all disrupted units are always eligible for a rally check during a friendly rally phase. So what do we have here? If you're next to an undisrupted uh, enemy unit, if you're part of a demoralized army, um, unless the units stack, okay. So anyway, we're going to use uh, Kupar again, we're going to use Dunhope, we're going to use the leader 11 and kill uh, Kiliad. They are all disrupted. Uh, in addition, these units are also on the same side and same force. They're under Fairfax uh, the foot. Fairfax's foot. <coughs> so, and on the opposing enemy side, this Newcastle unit is uh, in good order. This uh, Brighton or something, whatever his name is, is in good order. So, and so is uh, Tinsley, and so is this Newcastle unit, which must be, which, uh, well, Newcastle's the leader, so whatever. The unit under him is disrupted. <clears throat> uh, let me see here a minute. Affected by the enemy unit. Units that are part of a demoralized army are ineligible unless the unit is with them, but that's a demoralized army. So I'm guessing that even if a leader is stacked with 
a disrupted unit. I don't know if he can do that if his uh, disrupted uh, unit that he is with is adjacent. I don't see anything saying that you can. So I'm going to say that they can't regardless of whether the leader is there or not. Uh, units that are part of a demoralized army are ineligible unless the following statements apply to the unit. The unit stacked in the same hex with the leader of the same force, but that's still under demoralized army effects. The units one of Manchester's or the units one of Newcastle's force. So even if the uh, army's demoralized, those units can still rally. Uh, except as noted herein, so that's what we're going to do. Anyway, carrying on here. It's the rally phase, let's say, of the parliamentarian player. So he has this unit, this unit, and that unit at the moment that he can attempt to rally because they're the same color. Now all other disrupted um, parliamentarian units can, of course, attempt to um, rally if they're not adjacent to an enemy ordered unit. So let's say that, um, I'll take my die back here. Might pull out just a little bit. Sorry for the <laughs> vibrations and shaking and stuff. Okay, so we're going to try and do kill. kill. Ah! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Everybody settle down here. We're going to try and do uh, kill head here. However, he is adjacent to an ordered unit, Newcastle and Brighton, so he is ineligible to rally. Dunhope is eligible to, re to rally because he is next to his leader, Levin, who even though is adjacent to, well, these two are disrupted and have no, well, <laughs> actually these two are on his side and have no effect on that. Um, even though he's adjacent to Brighton, he can still affect Dunhope's chance to rally. And what he will do is he will add one to the rally rating, which is the center number. We have the combat strength, uh, rally number and the movement allowance. So it's a one plus one. He has to roll a two or less. And he rolls a two. So this unit, Dunhope, would rally if it were indeed the uh, Parliament, uh, parliament uh, player's turn. Well, I guess we're just going to hose everything up. Look, I'm trying to be more professional at this, but reality just keeps uh, interfering. Okay, now he can also attempt to uh, rally Kupar there, since uh, he's disrupted but not adjacent to an ordered enemy unit. He rolls a 5, and he needed a 2, so he would remain dis uh, disrupted, and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at, now let's see if I can get up there. I'll probably edit some of these gaffs out, so some things may not be quite, um, what's the word here? There may be a continuity issue during the video. Anyway, we're going to look at... thinking it's Kirkland. It's the one I can't spell. It's Kirk somebody. Um, he is a parliamentarian horse on Cromwell's side of the field and he is under hmm, let's see he is basically under Levin since he is of a blue unit. So, but he is not adjacent to a friendly unit, so he will have to roll a one or less um, to rally. And I roll a five, so he would remain disordered or disrupted. So that's pretty much how rally works. Next would come the uh, artillery phase for whichever player was the first player. Um, we'll just go ahead and use the allied player as being the first player for this demonstration. Artillery units cannot move um, from the hex they're initially placed in at the start of the game. They can be captured. 
by an enemy player which enters their hex and thus they now are um, maybe used by the enemy side as uh, one of their artillery units until or unless they are recaptured again. However, we'll say this unit was started here and it's the artillery phase for the parliamentarian player and he wishes to engage um, poor old Moore here who we're using as our uh, royalist victim here. What you would basically do, depending upon visibility of course, um, like if it was minimum visibility, you would only be able to fire up to two hexes. Uh, let's see, yes, two hexes. So it's clear visibility, no problem. You count up the number of hexes away, the target is away. One, two, three, four, five. So he is five hexes away. We will using the artillery table we will note that let's see if I can keep this even halfway from uh, shaking we will note that at five hexes away we only have about uh, what a third of a chance of uh, having any effect on the on the more unit but you know fire away because there's no ammo rules or anything like that so if you get the chance, go ahead and take the shot. So I roll, I roll a five. And as we can see, a five is a no effect. So the more unit would get off, uh, be lucky again. A little bit on line of sight. If an artillery unit and an enemy unit are on the same level or even the same hilltop or hilltop to hilltop then they have a clear line of sight the only things which block line of sight are woods close terrain town train baggage train hilltop or plump hexes or hexes containing artillery pieces or units of either side so Artillery pieces and hilltop hexes that are firing into other hilltop hexes ignore blocking hexes except for the plump hexes and those occupied by other artillery pieces or units. So in this example, the line of sight is clear from this artillery piece to um, a royalist unit more. So the artillery piece would be able to engage more at one, two, three hexes. And just for example, he would have a 50% chance of hitting more. Now, put him back here, let's say, and let's say there is a parliamentarian horse also on the hill, um, preparing to engage more through normal combat, not charging, because more is not disrupted. The parliamentarian artillery piece, 1118 would not be able to fire at more because there is an enemy or a friendly unit or blocking terrain in between the two and that would also just apply down here as well if uh, there was a unit here same thing he blocks uh, blocks artillery fire from the 1118 unit and the 1118 simply indicates which hex it starts in and remains in. So, then we come to the problem that I have. A unit firing from a hilltop hex to a non-hilltop hex in relationship to line of sight. If it's clear like that, then it's a free legal shot. There's no blocking terrain in between the artillery unit and the <coughs> royalist, royalist moor unit. And then we come to, like I said, the case that uh, 7.4 artillery pieces in a hilltop hex or hexes that are firing into non-hilltop hexes ignore blocking hexes that are more than half the total distance in hexes from the hex occupied by the target unit. Anybody that uh, wants to chime in here and 
give me their opinion or tell me how this rule actually works, I would appreciate it. But when it says that they ignore blocking hexes that are more than half the total distance, I understand that. So if we're at one, two, three, four, anything from here, here and here, they could uh, ignore a blocking unit. So they could ignore that unit there, or they could ignore this unit here. That's, uh, well, wait a minute. Actually just here, because that's more than half. That's three. So I can understand that. The uh, bowel, the bowel unit, <laughs> bowel ha, whatever, I don't know how to pronounce this name. I'm sure there's an explanation in here somewhere that gives you all the abbreviations for the names, but I'm not going to worry about it. <clears throat> So I can understand that part, but it says that you can ignore that. So I'm guessing that anything closer would um, block the train to the target hex, which kind of seems backwards to me, but well, if I can get a hold of this guy. So I'm guessing somebody here and let's say somebody here. <coughs> would be blocking because they are closer they're not more than halfway so it says yeah they're not more than half the total distance so I'm guessing they would block but say this unit over here would not block you know I don't know I'm guessing these are um, uh, below the level of the hill in such a way that the unit can fire over it um, but that's all I can kind of figure out about that rule. So that's pretty much how that works. And like I said, they can be captured. Artillery can be captured by enemy units. And so on and so forth. Okay, now a short example of movement. All units have a movement allowance. It's the right-hand number here. In this case, it's a four. Most foot have a four. Most horse have a six or eight. And, of course, cannon, artillery cannot move. Movement is pretty standard, you know. One movement point for clear terrain, etc., etc. However, unit types, um, terrain affects unit types differently. Or, unit types are affected by terrain differently. Like foot, and light horse, and heavy horse. They all pay one movement point from their movement point allowance to enter a clear hex. Let's say that units wanted to enter a woods hex. Um, a foot could enter a woods hex. Let me try to I guess an example of play would be the best thing to do. So I have the most sophisticated camera set up in the world. Um, we will use well, we we'll use more again. He's a great, uh, he's a great example. So, if Moore was right there and he wanted to uh, make it into the Willstrop Woods, it would cost him two to enter the woods. One for clear and two for the woods. So, we would go, get my big fat finger all the way. We would go one, two, and it cost him two more, three, four, to enter the woods. Uh, he can do that for that indicated cost. Now, a horse, let's say, wanted to enter the woods. We look down uh, under light or heavy horse, and in this case, it's a heavy horse because it, the uh, icon has a sword upraised. <clears throat> light horse does not have um, a sword um, as part of the icon. So he wants to enter the woods hex. The heavy horse does. But we look down under heavy horse and uh, woods and we see a P. He is prohibited from entering woods as well as town. All units are pro prohibited from entering town. The rest of it is just increasing penalties for entering different types of current uh, terrain and then crossing stream hex sides and stuff like that will cost you additional additional penalties so like I said he can't enter the woods 
he'd have to stop there or he would have to go around the woods. So we'll put Levinson back who is also in the Deadpool and we'll move down here <coughs> back here again to more <coughs> and a couple of parliamentarian units Ray and Hamilton so there are zones of control in the game but they only really affect uh, combat all good order non-disrupted units exert a zone of control into the six surrounding hexes um, and like I said they do not stop movement so more could theoretically one two three four and just you know move right through the two parliamentarian units therefore it is best to build a straight line of units um, not most economical but it's uh, if you do not want the enemy to break your line or whatever the best economical uh, defense would be putting a unit in every hex but like I said that's not always practical or possible now the other thing is if more wanted to move up and say engage the enemy one two three he would stop there because he can go no farther because of his movement allowance really and during the combat phase he has to mandatorily attack one of the other or in this case all of the good ordered units since he's adjacent to more than one unit and there's not another friendly unit nearby to um, take on one of the other enemy units he has no friendly unit to uh, support him so you know you're looking at what 8 to 21 something like that uh, so it would not behoove more to move up without some support uh, unless he um, is looking for trouble now let's say we had combat we total up the odds attackers more and the defenders are the three parliamentarian units um, and the result was a disruption of more you flip him over he has reduced uh, values on his back side uh, he becomes a 6-2-2 two, two. the morale stays the same but his combat strength is usually um, reduced uh, by several factors whatever the percentage of it is now he is disrupted I've been turning my disrupted units 60 degrees because it just helps me remember that they are they're also flipped over so that should be a key but in the heat of battle um, you never know at least this way I know that I cannot really use them and that the best thing I can do is retreat them or rally them there are no retreat rules per se but withdraw them so and there's no advance after combat either so now it's the parliamentarian uh, players turn let's say um, these units are not locked in a zone of control because well there is no locking zones of control to begin with however the more unit being disrupted does not exert a zone of control of any kind for any purpose disrupted units can attack they defend normally but if they suffer a second disruption as a result of combat but not artillery fire while disrupted they are eliminated they have no zones of control and the active player is never required to attack them although he can at his option disrupted foot units can be charged by heavy horse units and the charging process uh, you know like I said is they're doubled but heavy horse only can charge disrupted units and like I said they're doubled and if the uh, unit is already dis the enemy unit is disrupted it's eliminated the other thing about horse is it would be disrupted at the end of its charge so you know it's important that if you need to take the unit out at the risk of your horse then that's your option uh, let's see going back to disrupted units and zones of control disrupted foot okay disrupted units are unaffected by enemy zones of control 
Disruptor units do not expend movement points to move. Instead, the movement allowance on the back of each disrupted unit or unit is the number of hexes the unit can move each friendly movement phase while disrupted. And they follow normal movement rules, but they can always move those two hexes. And disruption only affects units. Leaders and artillery are not affected since they are not technically uh, um, units. So getting back to my example, I um, guess I'll use my forceps here, tweezers, since they don't require, um, they don't show my big fat fingers in the way. So he could just go one, two around him. He could go one, two, three, four around him. And this unit, Hamilton? Yes, Hamilton could just stay there and engage him at seven to two, or what, two to one, if he so desired. Um, but they don't have to. If they want to just kind of stay there in their defensive formation, they can just do so. In fact, at some points you want to stay there because now you are an ordered unit next to a disrupted unit and he cannot rally next turn because you may not rally adjacent to a good older unit. And that pretty much takes care of movement. Everything else is pretty much the same um, as a normal game. Leaders do not have any effect on movement. Their uh, rating is mainly for rally and combat purposes. So that's pretty much it. And attack, I've kind of covered it already. Um, multiple attacks. You must attack if you're in a ZOC of a ordered unit. That type of thing. And then the results. <clears throat> the results can be attacker disrupted, defender disrupted, defend disruption exchange, which we've seen some of that. Defender eliminated, attacker eliminated, and no effect. So we've seen the uh, Seen result, um, results of some of those. Leaders, if they are with a unit that is eliminated, they must make an evasion roll to survive. The player counts the distance and hexes from the leader to the nearest friendly unit, ignoring the presence of intervening terrain or enemy units. Distances greater than six are treated as six. The player then rolls a single six-sided die. If the result is greater than or equal to the distance to the nearest friendly unit, the leader is placed atop that unit. If there are two or more friendly units, you get to pick. If the die roll is less than the distance, the leader is immediately and permanently eliminated. And they do count for demoralization points and victory points. So, that's that. And there's not a whole lot. There's just leaders and demoralization, looting of the baggage train, <clears throat> how to win, that type of thing. We've covered pretty much most all of that except the demoralization, which in most common games like that, losses accumulate, and there is a level on each side, like the Royalist Army has a demoralization level of 100. Give you something different to look at. Uh, and the Allied Army has a demoralization level of 115. So as units are eliminated, leaders, <clears throat> combat units, that type of thing, they affect this demoralization level. And whenever their army reaches its demoralization level, all units of an army, regardless of the force to which they are attached, become demoralized. Except for Newcastle and Manchester's foot and horse. Uh, as soon as one army becomes demoralized, um, you stop recording loss points, their army remains demoralized for the rest of the game, and so on and so forth. Um, there is a special caveat up here for leaders. The allied leader Levin flees the battlefield whenever the allied train is first entered by a royalist unit. At the moment a royalist unit first enters the allied train hex, 11 piece is removed directly from the map and set aside. It does not come back and it does not count for demoralization or victory point accumulation. Basically he just took off. And anyway, once the forces are demoralized, the 
all demoralized uh, units of that, all disrupted units of a demoralized army have their movement allowance doubled, so they can kind of take off even faster. And certain heavy horse can't charge if their morale rating is less than three. Uh, let's see. Byron, Rupert, and the uh, RLG units of the Royalist Army can charge once that army is demoralized. No allied heavy horse units other than those attached to Manchester's force can charge once the allied army has become demoralized. And then there's trains and looting units, uh, you know, basically stop and it's hard to get them going again. And wins and loss, loss, win, victory conditions are based on points. And that's pretty much it. That is the crux meat of the game there. So, with that said, I will probably just play a little bit more of this game out on my own. I'll probably come back and just mention, uh, you know, who won and all that type of thing and show you the end of the game positioning. Uh, there's not really much more you can gain from watching me play. Um, I've shown you most of what uh, the game is about. And so with that, I will, my next video will come back with a recap. And then I shall begin another game. Or two, actually. I think I'm going to work on two games. And I'm also planning on working on my own series of mini games or micro games. So we'll see how that turns out. But until then, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one.